This talk will cover other demyelinating and dysmyelinating diseases. Let's start with an outline of what we're going to be discussing today. The first are the demyelinating diseases of the central nervous system that you need to know. Already covered are multiple sclerosis and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. I would recommend that you view that talk first. I'll then discuss osmotic demyelination syndrome, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, and adrenal leukodystrophy. I'll then cover two diseases that involve demyelination of both the central and the peripheral nervous system, and these are Crabbe disease and metachromatic leukodystrophy. Finally, I'll finish with two demyelinating diseases of the peripheral nervous system, Guillain-Barre and Charcot-Marie II. And I just want to comment if you can hear that noise in all of my videos. My office sits right outside the L, so the L is going by every couple of minutes as I give these talks, so I apologize for the noise. All right, so I want to repeat this slide from the multiple sclerosis talk, and it's a slide regarding myeloma within the central nervous system. So as you recall, gray matter contains neuronal cell bodies, and white matter contains myelinated axons. Myelin is the proteolipid insulation of the axons and is produced by the oligodendrocyte within the central nervous system. As you recall, an oligodendrocyte can myelinate many axons and is different in this way from Schwann cells. Oligodendrocytes are derived from the neuroectoderm. It is important to know about oligodendrocytes and the production of myelin for step one. This slide is also repeated from the multiple sclerosis talk and reminds us that there are both demyelinating disease and leukodystrophies uh, that are somewhat variable. Demyelinating disease affect the preformed myelin and can be caused by multiple etiologies such as vascular insult, toxic exposures, or inflammation. Leukodystrophies, on the other hand, affect myelin formation and maintenance and tend to be caused by genetic or hereditary factors. A couple of the disorders that we will be covering in this talk are listed on this graph and include central pontine myelinisis, adrenal leukodystrophy, metachromatic leukodystrophy, and Crabbe's disease. The first disorder I would like to discuss is osmotic demyelination syndrome. Another name for this is central pontine myelinisis. And I like to remember it as central pontine myelinisis because it really is a better description of the location and what's happening. Now, although it's called central pontine myelinisis, you can have this demyelination syndrome outside of the pons, and that's why it was renamed osmotic demyelination syndrome. This particular syndrome occurs when you have destruction of the myelin sheath within the white matter, typically within the brainstem or pons. This is an iatrogenic disorder, and I'm hoping that none of you who listen to this talk will ever cause this disorder when you're treating patients on the wards. This occurs from a rapid rise of serum osmolality, and the way this happens is because you have rapidly corrected hyponatremia. When you correct hyponatremia quickly, you will cause this demyelination syndrome and it is irreversible. Because of what we know about this disorder, it is now clear we should not correct hyponatremia any faster than 10 milliequivalents per liter in the first 24 hours the patient is admitted. The clinical signs of this disorder are typically brainstem signs, acute paralysis, dysarthria, dysphagia, and diplopia. So you will see both a combination of cortical spinal findings and cranial nerve abnormalities. There are certain patient populations that are at higher risk of this disorder, and these populations include alcoholics, patients with liver or kidney failure, or patients who are admitted for pancreatitis. The patient will typically be admitted with a normal neurological exam, and when you, after you rapidly correct their sodium, they will develop these brainstem signs, and on imaging will have this pontine abnormality you can see on the MRI scan. The second demyelination syndrome I'd like to discuss in the central nervous system is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. In this particular disorder, you have demyelination because of destruction of the oligodendrocytes. This is because of a viral infection. The JC virus, which was named after the first patient identified with this disorder, is ubiquitous. So about 70% of the general population has antibodies to the JC virus. In patients who are chronically immunodeficient, you can have reactivation of this virus and subsequently develop the clinical signs of this disorder. Patients who have neoplasms or chronic immunodeficiency are at highest risk of PML. We frequently see PML most often in patients who have AIDS 
or have multiple sclerosis and are on immune modulating medications. Patients will present with personality change or intellectual impairment and also will develop other signs such as hemiparesis, visual field cuts, aphasia, ataxia, and confusion. This is an irreversible disorder and death typically occurs within three to six months. As you've noted with the clinical presentation, the presentation tends to be of cortical signs. This disorder can be treated with antiretroviral therapy in patients who have AIDS, and steroids are frequently used as well in patients who do not have AIDS, although it is unclear whether this is beneficial long-term. Let's move now into some leukodystrophies. Leukodystrophies are inherited disorders that affect the white matter of the central nervous system. There are approximately 30 that are now identified. These disorders affect the glial cells and lead to myelin sheath and axonal damage. Clinically, you will typically identify a leukodystrophy in a child who has regression in their developmental skills, failure to acquire new skills, and we want to remember that some of the leukodystrophies will affect the peripheral nervous system or patients who are older. Neuroimaging across these disorders will show symmetric hyperintensities on T2 MRI. Treatment is supportive, and you may find yourself treating things such as seizures, spasticity, dystonia, which is a movement disorder, and autonomic dysfunction. Let's discuss a couple of these leukodystrophies. The first is Crabbe disease, which is also termed globoid cell leukodystrophy. You will want to remember the term globoid cell because this is frequently tested. This particular disorder is autosomal recessive and is a lysosoma storage disease. It results from a deficiency of galactocerebrosidase, which is an enzyme. Because you lack this enzyme, there is a buildup of two compounds, galactocerebroside and cycazine, which destroy the myelin sheath in both the central and peripheral nervous system. Clinically, you will see patients who have developmental delay, peripheral neuropathy, optic atrophy, and treatment will be uh, performed by hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Now, in some states, Crabbe disease is included on the newborn screen. However, uh, those, not all patients will respond to stem cell transplantation. It tends to alter progression best in patients who are asymptomatic at the time of the transplant, and in those patients, about 100% survive. Metachromatic leukodystrophy is also an autosomal recessive lysosomal st storage disease. It results from an enzyme deficiency of aerosulfatase A. Sulfatides accumulate in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system and destroy the myelin sheath. Clinically, a child will present with a decline in motor skills, and adults will present with dementia and ataxia. Many of these patients will present with peripheral nervous system bindings. These patients will also have gallbladder involvement, and this is unique amongst the leukodystrophies. There is no newborn screening that has been instituted yet for metachromatic leukodystrophy. Hematopoietic stem cell transplant can alter the progression, again, if the patient is asymptomatic but can be combined with gene therapy in order to uh, have even greater improvement in the patient. <clears throat> Adrenal leukodystrophy is an X-linked disorder, meaning it affects males only, of the peroxisome. Because of this uh, genetic mutation, patients will have accumulation of very long chain fatty acids in the blood. This accumulation occurs in the brain, the adrenal gland, and the testes. Clinically, there are multiple phenotypes that are seen, adrenal insufficiency, cognitive decline, and attention difficulties in boys. These boys then develop a loss of ambulation, <clears throat> their speech, vision, and hearing within two years of symptom onset. There is a, a later in life axonopathy that occurs in adults, and this is termed adrenomyeloneuropathy, although it is less common. For patients with adrenal leukodystrophy, the treatment is focused on adrenal supplementation and again, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which can arrest or slow progression. Gene therapy has also been used for this disorder. Some of you may have seen the movie Lorenzo's Oil, which is a dietary supplementation that is used for adrenal leukodystrophy patients. However, although it is lower, does lower very long chain fatty acids in the blood, it is not effective in slowing down 
uh, abnormalities of cognition or other neurological signs. I would like to point out that in adrenal leukodystrophy, we see white matter abnormalities on the MRI scan that are predominantly focused in the posterior lobes. Uh, we will also see abnormalities in the temporal parietal lobes as well. And this is different than the other adrenal leukodystrophies where we have white matter abnormalities throughout the cortex. Let's move into uh, disorders that affect myelin in the peripheral nervous system. As a reminder, the Schwann cell is the principal glia of the peripheral nervous system and is supportive of neurons. Each Schwann cell myelinates only one axon and promotes axonal regeneration. It is derived from the neural crest, and here is a picture of that relationship. Guillain-Barre is the first demyelinating disorder of the peripheral nervous system I would like to address. This disorder is also called acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy and it affects peripheral nerves and motor fibers. This disorder is frequently associated with infections. The most common infection that has been associated is Campylobacter jejuni. What happens with infection of this organism is that there is molecular mimicry within the body that leads to an autoimmune attack on peripheral myelin. On the right, you can see the attack of the immune system on the myelin and down here, you can see the attack uh, associated with the jejuni affection, C. jejuni infection, um, that's attacking both the myelin and the axon as well. And I just want to say thank you to Dr. Sony, who provided a couple of the slides in this section. The clinical features of Guillain-Barre syndrome are that it causes a symmetric ascending muscle weakness. The legs are affected first, then the arms, then the face. Approximately 50% of patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome will have facial paresis. Finally, the oropharynx is, pharynx is affected. Autonomic dysregulation is rare, or I'm sorry, is common, and this will include uh, cardiac musculature. Respiratory failure occurs in 30% of patients with Guillain-Barre, and pain can occur in 60 to 70% of patients. The time course of onset of neurological symptoms is fast. It can occur over the course of 24 hours out to four weeks. On examination, the key finding, in addition to weakness, is the loss of deep tendon reflexes. Approximately 60% of patients will present with a history of infection, typically an upper respiratory tract infection and less commonly diarrhea or pneumonia. With a spinal tap, we will see an elevated protein in the cerebrospinal fluid, but you will not see inflammatory cells. This is a picture of what we would see on a nerve conduction study in a patient with Guillain-Barre syndrome. On the top is a normal individual, and when you stimulate the nerve, you will see normal conduction down the nerve. However, in an individual with Guillain-Barre syndrome on the bottom, you can see when the nerve is stimulated, there is not a normal response. There's essentially a block to the conduction. And again, this occurs because of the destruction of the myelin. We can treat Guillain-Barre syndrome. The American Academy of Neurology has put out a guideline that tells us that there is no significant difference in treating patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome with IVIG versus plasma exchange. And this includes several outcomes, such as time to discontinuation of mechanical ventilation, the amount of proportion dead or disabled after one year. There is no role for steroids in this disorder, and you can use IVIG or plasma exchange in children. The management of Guillain-Barre syndrome includes supportive care. These patients need to be hospitalized, and many of them will have a stay in the intensive care unit. We want to make sure we monitor their lung function with forced vital capacity and immediately intubate the patient if the forced vital capacity drops or if there's a rapid decline with respiratory distress. Severe oropharyngeal weakness will also trigger us to intubate. Pain control is something that's very important for these patients as it is quite common in the disorder. The prognosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome is variable. About 5 to 8 percent of patients will die from Guillain-Barre and another 20 percent will have long-term disability. There are several factors that portend a poor prognosis and this includes an older age, a longer time to maximum symptoms, the need for ventilatory support, 
diarrhea prior to the onset of the symptoms, other medical comorbidities, and if there is axonal degeneration. So although the myelin is primarily affected in this disorder, you can have axonal degeneration if the disease is severe. Let's move next into a final demyelinating disease of the peripheral nervous system, and that is Charcot-Marie II. This disorder is a hereditary motor sensory neuropathy. There are several types of this disorder due to the fact that it is caused by mutations in several genes. Most of these disorders are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, and all of them result in defective production of proteins that are responsible for the structure and function of myelin sheath. A couple examples include myelin protein zero and gap junction proteins. On the right is a picture that reminds us that when you have problems with destruction of the myelin or scarring of the myelin, such as you see in Charcot-Marie tooth, you will not have normal conduction down the nerve. This picture is very similar to the picture I showed in multiple sclerosis with damage of the myelin in the central nervous system. There are three clinical patterns of Charcot-Marie tooth. The first pattern, which we see most commonly, is a slowly progressive symmetric distal lead weakness with sensory loss. And this can occur in childhood or up to the age of 40. These patients will progress to have foot drop and hand weakness, and they will lose reflexes. The second clinical pattern is in very young onset, where these patients will have delayed walking. They usually won't start to walk until age 15 months or later. Patients with young onset may also have toe walking or clumsiness as well. Many of them will require bracing, walkers, and wheelchairs. The third pattern is an adult onset, and these patients have variable progression. Foot deformities are common in Charcot-Marie tooth. Patients can have pes cavus, which is this high rounded arch you can see in the upper picture, or hammer toes, which you can see in the lower picture. These patients will all tend to have lower extremity weakness and can have sensory deficits as well. This disorder is usually painless and they will also have slowed conduction velocities on their nerve conduction tests. Just wanna make one final comment about these disorders. Some of these disorders primarily affect the central nervous system. And as we know, you are gonna see patients who have upper motor neuron signs or brainstem findings. And it in addition to other abnormalities that localize to the central nervous system. These last disorders that affect the peripheral nervous system are going to include patients who have a lower motor neuron pattern of abnormalities. They are going to have decreased or absent reflexes and they will have no upper motor neuron signs. Some of the disorders, as I said, will affect both the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, and I've given you two in this talk, so you need to go back and review if you don't remember which ones they are. Good luck studying.